What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the 23rd Scikit Learn with Python for Machine Learning with our investing uh, practical example tutorial video. Uh, where we left off, we were we basically built the data set that we want to uh, kind of predict against, and we have our training data set now. So what we're ready to do is see what we got. So first, we're going to do I'm going to do Control A and Delete again. You may want to save this one. This is a forward test backup now. So in theory, now we might have up to five total programming or scripts rather. So delete, but you might want to save that. And now we're going to visit tutorial number 20's code, which was the original uh, training and testing script. So now we're going to do control A, control C, control V, boom. So now with this script, basically this now our old data can be the testing. And just for the record, we probably should train and test, or I mean, yeah, train and then forward test based on the exact same kind of principles, you know, no NA or with NA. So just keep that in mind. So uh, moving forward to here, uh, what we want to do is so uh, analysis. And then basically at the very end, you know, here is where we'll add some new stuff. So this was our, you know, training and testing. But now what we can do is we can say data <clears throat> underscore DF equals <laughs> pd dot data frame dot from underscore csv and then we call this forward sample and then I'm trying to think what we did forward sample I think and with NA or no NA and we're currently this script is a no NA script so we'll do no underscore NA dot csv then we'll come down and we'll say data df uh, equals data underscore df dot replace. And we replace all not available data with a zero. And then we had again do a replace function and we replace any not a number data with a zero. So moving right along, we're going to say now capital X equals uh, an inf I think we can maybe get by by at least doing this. Because really we just have an X. We don't really need to calculate for Y. We just need X and Z. And Z will be... Uh, let's just take all this and I'll, we'll deal with that in a second. So <laughs> copy and paste that. Come on down here. And paste. We'll get rid of Y and the... Uh, X pre-processing can stay. The value of C is also uh, going to change, or Z rather, is also going to change. Uh, so here, features, um, that stays the same. Let me make sure we actually did all caps features here, yes. Okay, so X equals numpy dot array data df features dot values X pre-processing scale good z is equal to data underscore df ticker dot values dot to list that should do yeah. okay now uh, what we want to do is we're going to say invest underscore list equals empty uh, well, my dog is totally snoring over there I don't want to wake him up Anyway, hopefully y'all can't hear that. <laughs> Invest list uh, for i in range len x. So basically for the length of x, which should be capitalized x, uh, what do we want to do? We're going to say p for prediction equals clf dot predict capital x, the ith. <laughs> And then the zero width. So that'll be the prediction. And then if P equals one, i.e. if we're predicting that it will outperform, then let's go ahead and print the Z, the ith of Z. And then we're gonna say invest list dot append the ith of Z. And then finally at the very end, let's go ahead and print len invest list. We're just kind of curious what the length, the total length is at the end. And then just in case we forgot, we can print invest list. Okay, cool. 
Next, our training set. We currently, right, we're, we're testing, you know, against all of these. We're training and then we're testing against all the samples. I'm going to call this one for now. I don't want to deal with minus zero at the moment. Uh, so we'll kind of ignore, you know, these results. And in fact, just to further ignore them, we'll just stop printing out junk from them because now we're just interested in the predictions. So uh, this is with no not available data. Let's save and run that and see what we get. If we get anything. <laughs> Division by zero compared. Oh, I see. Okay, hold up, hold up. Hold up. Um, basically, all this will just uh, come out. Try it again. Okay, yeah. That was, that was somewhat expected. Uh, so we have a huge list of companies to invest in here. We don't want that many companies. Okay, we're not interested in that many companies to invest in. So the next thing that we might want to consider doing, well, first of all, let's go ahead and uh, we'll do with NA. With NA, come up here, with NA. Uh, also, I do want to, uh, where I'm totally lost. I want to know, I guess we can maybe find it. Let me do something really quick here. Okay, so just for the record, the total number of stocks that we're considering is 560. So of the 560 companies in the S&P 500, we've chosen 288, so a little over half. Uh, so anyways, closing that. Uh, now we're with not available, and let's run that one more time. And so we're finding that we most likely have a list of companies to invest in that is slightly slightly too big. Uh, we're not really wanting to necessarily, and this one's even bigger, my goodness. Hopefully it's not the whole thing. Yeah, okay. It's almost the whole freaking thing though. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, we, we're, we're not the happiest with this output. So um, anyway, uh, this algo is very bullish in the market. Okay, so so now what? Um, both of these kind of returned a list that is very large. So what can we do? I mean, yeah, for one, we, we could say that, well, if we're investing in the market, we're in theory investing in 500 companies. So if you know we're considering no NA and we're getting returned a list of half of the S&P, well, well, not half, but probably half if we got rid of the company, because right now our full list is, 560 and we return 280. So in theory, if we pulled against just the S&P 500 companies, we could relatively estimate that we're going to get 250 back. So in theory, we're saying, okay, well, half of the companies we think will, these are the half that we'll think will, will outperform. So also in theory, uh, if you just think about it, half of the companies in the S&P 500 are likely to outperform the S&P 500 and half of them are likely to underperform the S&P 500, right? That's just statistics, okay? So obviously if one company significantly outperforms, it might take the place of two or three companies or something like that. Uh, but statistics wise, probably half of the companies outperform and half the companies underperform, right? That's just the way it has to be. So um, in theory, we could be right on the mark and pick the perfect half of companies. Unlikely, but we could. But what if we want to maybe, see this is kind of a low risk, right? Because we're investing in a large pool of companies. So maybe that's what you want. But what if you'd rather have a smaller list of companies you're invested in? You know, maybe you'd rather pay, you'd like to pay more attention. So a lot of investors like to really go in deep into the companies that they're invested in. Like this would be just the starting point to finding a company. And then from there, they might do more research on that company. So they want a smaller handful of, of companies. So what might we do? Now, before I brought up that, well, we could we could kind of change our scale a bit, right? We could organize companies by, by, uh, by um, you know, match the market. And by match, I mean perform within, let's say, half of a percent or within 1%. Uh, so that would be match the market. Then we could have outperform the market, anything from 1% to 5% outperformance, that's outperform. And then anything greater than 5 
significantly outperform the market. And then same thing on the other side, underperform, significantly underperform. So we could do something like that. Uh, but my argument is that that's unnecessary. We don't need to do that because we, the only reason why we would do that is to say, okay, we only want to buy into these significant outperformers. So what do we do to handle that situation? Well, we would go back into our uh, you know data compilation basically, and underperform or basically because we convert underperform to zero and outperform to one, right? That's what we end up doing. And in theory, what we could do is actually just from now on just call stocks either a zero or one. Zero is don't buy. One is friggin' buy. And what we would do is we would we would mark or label a company and its features. Uh, a one if it outperforms the market by more than say five or six percent so we can do that and if it doesn't it's a zero we don't care how badly it underperforms it's just a zero uh, so we can go through and do that to our um, our list here because what is happening um, when you start adding more and more categories first of all accuracy is going to go down I mean that's that only makes sense because Especially when we're saying like significantly outperform or just outperform, just that kind of dichotomy there, you're you're far less likely to get that right, you know, because now we're more of a scale than anything else. But uh, so accuracy will go down, but that's not necessarily good or you know a bad thing. Um, it just you have more categories, so you've got more chances of being wrong, and and really then now we have to consider the degree of incorrectness. Uh, so that kind of stuff ha uh, ends up coming up, but. Anyways, uh, we'll cut it off here, and what I'll start talking about in the next video is um, kind of increasing our standards for companies that we're, we consider investing in. And not only can we increase the standards just in general, we can increase the standards and we can test that. We can say, okay, well, when we increase the standards, uh, does that improve our performance uh, compared to market? Yes or no? And if it doesn't, then we probably shouldn't be increasing our standards. We should, in we should invest in 280 stocks, let's say. Uh, but if it does improve, then we should consider doing that, you know, right? We should we should keep that up and then and invest in fewer companies. Uh, and then also we can also calculate and then we can calculate risk. Generally, risk is hard to calculate, but you calculate risk by what's called drawdown. And so, how often do you have significant drawdown? Which basically, you know, it's almost like a calculation of volatility. Uh, but also like how often do we have stocks that take us down and if you have a lot of stocks that take you down yet you have a lot of stocks that move you up even though it might average out and be okay you want to get rid of instances where you have drawdown and that's kind of actually more even if if you even if over the course of like a year you've got one guy that has 15 percent outperformance because he's got some good stocks some bad stocks but his good stocks worked out well really well but his bad stocks were pretty bad but it didn't matter averaged out to 15 percent but then you've got another guy who averaged say 12 percent but over market let's say if you have a 12 percent he probably didn't outperform let's say another guy 12 percent but he didn't have like any drawdown like all of his companies outperformed over the course of that year uh that would be more ideal right because drawdown equals risk so anyways lots of topics to consider next video what we'll be talking about is just searching for significant outperformers so stay tuned for that. If you have any questions or comments on this video, please feel free to leave them below. Otherwise, as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for all the support of the subscriptions. And until next time.